says the following. You don't have to know what's going on anywhere outside of a little ball. If you want to know what's, what the potential is here, you tell me what it is on the surface of any ball, no matter how small. You don't have to look outside. You just tell me what is in the neighborhood and how much mass there is in the ball. The rule is this. The man you just saw speaking is physicist Richard Feynman, giving a lecture at Cornell in 1964. I remember watching this in my dorm room my freshman year of undergrad, and I was bewildered by Feynman's average on a ball concept, whatever that meant. In this video, I want to really dive into what Feynman is talking about here. And in the process, we'll develop a deep intuitive understanding of what the second derivative really does in math and physics, and why it shows up in the Schrodinger equation, ENM, and elsewhere. As a heads up, I'll assume you have some familiarity with Taylor series, insofar as you know that we can expand a function as such. Now, before we dive in, really quick, I want to let you all know of a really cool opportunity from a few Harvard Physics PhD students working with the Harvard Quantum Initiative. In celebration of World Quantum Day, they are hosting a Quantum Shorts contest over on their HQI blog. This is a contest open to absolutely anyone, regardless of your background or experience in physics. Basically, they invite you to create a short video on a quantum topic of your choosing, using your creativity to explain some aspect of quantum physics. After submitting your entry, you have the chance to win Harvard merchandise or even a trip to Harvard to explore their quantum research facilities and meet the scientists that push quantum research forward. This is a really neat opportunity hosted by some super passionate people, so check out their blog and contest if you're interested. I'll have it linked in the description. The deadline is May 14th, 2024, so good luck if you choose to submit anything. Now, to begin our journey on the second derivative, I think we should quickly review our intuition of the first derivative. Essentially, say we have some variable x and a point x0. Likewise, let's say we have some function f of x, where I've indicated where f of x0 lands on this number line. If we move x a tiny bit away from x0, we will correspondingly move f of x a tiny bit away from f of x0. If then we take the change in f of x and divide by the change in x, you intuitively get the first derivative at the point x0. Formally, you've got all the limits and whatnot, but this is the intuition. So the first derivative intuitively tells us how much f changes when we change x by a tiny amount. So what about the second derivative? What does it tell us? Well, usually we're taught that it tells us how the first derivative changes when we change the input by a tiny amount. But this understanding kind of sucks. I don't want to know what the second derivative tells me about the first derivative. I want to know what it tells me about the function itself. So how do we go about trying to intuitively understand the second derivative? Well, here's where we're going to follow Feynman's lead. So let's dig into this average on a ball concept he was talking about, first in one dimension. Let's say we have some function and let's look at a particular point x0. What I want to do is look at the points right next to x0, both a distance dx away. Note that this is what a ball is in one dimension. It's all the points of radius dx away from x0. Now, again, trusting Feynman for a moment, I want to know if the value of f at the points next to x0 are on average greater than or less than the value of f at x0. Here we see they are both greater, but how do we quantify this? One way to measure this is by calculating the average of f for the points around x0, where I've used this fancy double bracket to indicate the average. Then subtract the value of f at x0. This should tell us just how much higher or lower, on average, the points around x0 are. Take a second to make sure you understand what this quantity represents. This might seem like a random expression, but let's follow through with it for a moment. First, let's calculate the value of this average term. The average of the two values around x0 is calculated exactly as we'd expect, by adding then dividing by 2. Now, remember that dx is supposed to be pretty small. So that should inspire us to Taylor expand both of these quantities around the point x0. The Taylor series of the point to the right of x0 can be written as follows, while the series of the point to the left of x0 can be written similarly. Now, if we add the two, note that the terms with an odd power of dx will cancel out, leaving only the terms with an even power of dx. So we get the following. 
Now, note that using a first order expansion of both terms wouldn't have worked here. Usually that does the trick, but notice that the first order approximations canceled out. We'll have more to say on this in a moment, but keep this in mind. So dividing by two, we get that the average of the points around x naught can be written as follows. Now we can subtract the point at the center, f of x naught, from both sides. To proceed, I'm going to then divide both sides by dx squared. Now let's take the limit as dx goes to 0 on both sides. Note that all the terms with dx squared and higher on the right hand side will go to 0. If we then move the 1 half in front of the second derivative to the left hand side, we are left with the following. This is a really neat result. We have found that the second derivative at a point is related to the average of the values around that point minus the value of the function. And if we take a moment to think about this result, this should make a lot of intuitive sense. Remember that we usually use the second derivative to study the curvature of functions. If a function is concave up, then at any point, the values of the function around that point are on average higher. So the limit we derived a few moments ago would be positive, giving us a positive second derivative. And if a function is concave down, then at any point, the values of the function around that point are on average lower. So the limit is negative and we get a negative second derivative. So this whole average on a ball business is really just a way to quantitatively capture the curvature of a function, which happens to be related to the second derivative. Now, what is the curvature of a straight line? Zero which explains why the first order terms in the Taylor expansion canceled out. Those terms represent the linear part of the function, which contribute nothing to the curvature. So we see that the second derivative for a single variable function has a really neat geometric interpretation in terms of the average value around a point minus the value at the point itself. Now, say we wanted to extend this idea to three dimensions. How would we do that? Necessarily, this becomes a problem in multivariable calculus, but we can guess what the solution would be in this case. In three dimensions, to find the average value of a function around a point, we would look at a tiny sphere of radius dx around that point, and take the average value of all the points on that sphere. Then, we would just subtract that average by the value in the middle of the sphere. Our claim is that this is related to some three-dimensional version of the second derivative. It turns out this is 100% correct. In three dimensions, the corresponding expression is as follows, where the second derivative in three dimensions is written using this symbol here called the Laplacian. The only difference is that the two has become a six. And in fact, that number is always two times the number of dimensions that you're in. For those of you who've taken a multivariable calculus course, you will recognize the Laplacian and know how to calculate it. But for anyone who hasn't, Let's just take this to mean a second derivative in three dimensions, which it really is. Now, for those of you interested in a derivation of this fact, which you are very much entitled to, I've included the link to a clean derivation in the description. This is one of those expressions that is much better suited to being derived on paper, where you can see each calculational step as opposed to me flashing 100 equations on the screen for 20 minutes. That being said, the intuition for this equation is exactly the same as the one dimensional case. Now, taking this expression as a fact, we can actually already use it to intuitively derive some of the most important equations in modern physics without doing any tedious math. For example, say we have some electrical charge distribution defined by a function rho of x. How would we come up with an equation for the potential energy function generated by this charge distribution? Although this seems like a tough problem, we can use our newfound intuition to give it a shot. Let's say we have a region of negative charge. If we take a positive charge and pull it away from this region, the attractive force means that we have to put in work to do so. So it gains electrical potential energy as we pull it away from this region, similar to how lifting something gives it more gravitational potential energy. Likewise, if we instead had a region of positive charge and we pulled our particle away from this region, the positive charge is being repelled, so it loses potential energy. So let's use this intuition to form a differential equation. 
Say we have our potential energy function defined in all space. And let's look at some point x0. We can then examine the average potential energy on a tiny sphere around x0. If the potential energy is bigger at points away from x0, then our intuition tells us that there should be some negative charge here, because that means our particle gains potential energy by moving away from x0. Likewise, if the potential is smaller at points away from x0, then our intuition tells us that there should be some positive charge here. So, summarizing all this, we can use our physicist's intuition to guess that maybe an equation of the following form is right. The second derivative of the potential, which tells us the average of how much greater the potential is around any given point, should be proportional to the negative of the charge density at that point x0. Take a second and digest this, and you'll see that this exactly describes the conclusions we made a moment ago. And it turns out, this is exactly right. This is in fact one of Maxwell's equations, with a equal to 1 over the permittivity of free space. So we have intuitively derived an equation without needing any fancy electromagnetic theory. Although we got somewhat lucky that the relationship on rho wasn't something more complex, you'd be surprised how often nature seems to choose the simplest expression. Now, given that this channel has been dedicated to quantum mechanics in the past, we can also use our newfound understanding to develop further intuition into quantum phenomena. Specifically, I want to look at the kinetic energy operator in quantum mechanics, which in the position basis can be written as the second derivative. Now, even if you've never seen this before or never even taken a course in quantum mechanics, we can still understand why this quantity should represent kinetic energy. To recap some quantum physics, the wave function is a function that tells us the probability amplitude of where your particle is. With just this, we can already use our second derivative intuition to derive some quantum facts. First, let's assume the position wave function of our particle looks like a simple Gaussian. For now, let's assume it's a fairly tight Gaussian, meaning our particle is well localized around some point in space. So how do we interpret the kinetic energy operator on this wave function? Well, if we take this relation as a fact for the moment, then at the peak of our wave function, all the points around it are on average much, much smaller. So using our newly developed intuition, we expect the second derivative to be a big negative number, which when multiplied by the negative, means that this quantity should be a relatively large positive number. I say relatively because h-bar is tiny, but the smaller we localize this Gaussian, the bigger we make this number. Now, this should be a somewhat shocking result. Although it's a bit wishy-washy to interpret an operator at a single point, this statement approximately holds true in the region where our particle is localized. So why should this be surprising? Well, all we did was define where our particle was localized in space, and nowhere did we input how it was moving or in what direction. So why and where is our particle getting this magnitude of kinetic energy? What we are discovering here is in fact a vestige of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Note that our particle is really tightly confined in space, so we have a really low uncertainty in position. The uncertainty principle then dictates that we must therefore be wildly uncertain in our particle's momentum, and therefore it can take on large magnitudes, increasing our particle's kinetic energy. And in fact, if we time evolve this initial quantum state, the solution we would get would be a Gaussian that spreads out through time, since that extra kinetic energy from momentum uncertainty pushes your particle outwards. So now we can see that the kinetic energy operator in quantum mechanics not only measures how fast our particle is moving, but it also carries information on how the uncertainty principle affects its motion. The more localized our wave function is, and therefore the smaller the average values around it are, the more its motion and energy will be warped by momentum uncertainty. I think this is absolutely fascinating, and it gives us some intuition into how the uncertainty principle is baked into the Schrodinger equation through that second derivative. Now, before wrapping up the video, I encourage you to think of how you can use this understanding of the second derivative to build new intuitions. For example, think about what the differential heat equation is actually saying. Likewise, in quantum physics, higher energy wave functions tend to have smaller and smaller wavelengths. How can we now understand this? I will leave this up to you to think about. As a physicist and mathematician, 
Hopefully, I've given you another tool you can use to understand our world, much in the same way that Feynman did for me many years ago. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and I'll do my best to answer it. I hope you all had a great quantum day.